Marsh is our, our chief clinical officer, and uh, she joined us in 1989 when she was 12 years old. Um, Marsh is, um, is currently our, our uh, you started as a vice president, but she has a PhD, she's an RN, she um, is an instructor at um, UCSD, USD in the uh, nursing program there. Um, and she's responsible for all of our clinical um, processes and quality processes at AMN and, and just an expert in helping nurses learn and understand the business of healthcare. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Marcia and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you two minutes here. Okay. Thanks, Ralph. I was afraid he was... I was afraid he was going to um, say a fun fact about me that I was nervous about, so I got, I got by that one easily, didn't I? Wildcat. Yeah, 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 well, Wildcat fan. Um, no, my only my fun fact I tell about myself is that I, I do like to garden, and uh, one of the things that I experimented with was pomegranate jelly recently, so it was fun. It tasted good. Um, anyway, I'm going to, um, I, I realize I'm probably the only thing in my slides between you and happy hour, so hopefully I've got an interesting presentation for you, really to dive into recruiting. And I, you know, start this, I've got to get used to the clicker here, um, with times are changing, but you know, AMN is kind of in this unique position where I've been since, with the company since 1989 definitely seen changes in how we recruit people. But we um, actually had on our payroll or through 1099s last year, 22,000 people, unique people. About half of those were new to the organization. So we've got a recruiting machine in place right now that just really goes across the country um, in, in terms of getting the word out about what we do and what the needs are in healthcare across the country. So I just wanted to start with, you know, how times are changing. So, you know, at one point, and I, I wasn't with AMN when we were um, recruiting for the Pony Express, um, but as years went by, this is where, um, you know, I started my career and I was sort of like Diana. I'm a nurse, um, was in critical care, um, moved into nurse recruitment in the mid-80s, um, and this is how we recruited um, in the mid-80s was with classified advertisements, right? We ran ads every, every Sunday in the weekend. But, you know, uh, by 1999 or so, the job boards came into the market. Monster was the first one, and actually I think they had their board up a year before that, but then you started to see Career Builder and some of those other job boards that, I, you know, we probably have forgotten about them since then, because soon after that, 2005-ish, we got the social media sites, right? The first one that uh, was launched was actually LinkedIn in 2002. Um, Facebook came along in 2004, YouTube a year after that, and then um, Twitter, 2006. Followed by, a very short few years later, this mobile app explosion, right? So now it's the apps on the, the mobile phones and what we're doing about that. And I don't know what's next and when it's coming, but we've gotta be watching out for it. And I think part of the art of recruiting and attracting talent to your organizations has to do with you keeping up with what's going on out there and how you're gonna to continue to bring people into your organization. So I wanna spend time um, talking about a, a little bit of the of survey data that's out there by other organizations, but I am gonna focus a fair amount on some things that AMN has done as well, because in this area of recruiting and especially with the movement from the job boards to the social media, to the mobile apps. We've really done a lot of creative things that I think may be helpful for you all. I think there's health systems out there that do a really good job at this, and then there's others, like we heard from somebody earlier who said, you know, they got a, it was Katie, I think, who said they got to know from the top that they didn't want to do anything to do with social media, and I think I'll show you today how very important it is that you know and understand your social media uh, really, really well. Um, so this data comes from a survey that was, um, uh, published on Bullhorn, but it was from the North America, it was called the North American Staffing and Recruiting Trends Survey. Um, basically saying that among recruiting and staffing professionals, increased access to passive job seekers was, was imperative. That's really what they saw as their imperative for 2013. I don't want people coming to me, I want to be able to go find them. Um, and so that was um, pretty critical. Um, they were asked to also asked to identify one factor that offers the greatest opportunity in recruiting for 2013. 47% of them said, and this was the highest percentage of any category, increased active, um, access to those passive candidates via social media um, routes. So that's really what they're looking for. 
Um, 97% of these um, professionals are using LinkedIn. I know we also heard that nurses, and this is really from our AMN survey, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, also talks about nurses really like Facebook, but whereas other professionals are leaning towards um, LinkedIn quite a bit more. Um, the newer um, social media um, sites, uh, Google Plus and Pinterest, um, have also kind of peaked their, their um, faces up a little bit as well, too. So the, the top one still is LinkedIn with Facebook and uh, Twitter following. Um, Pinterest is really new on the scene, seems like just in the last couple of years, so only has a, a small uh, 3% um, right now. Um, the other thing that came out in this survey was um, you know, rate, asking the recruiters to rate the effectiveness of, of various common methods of finding candidates. So it was a one to five scale. Uh, one is least effective and five is most effective. Um, and the first, the highest score was networking with other people, firms, and associations. Came out with the highest score of 4.17. Um, referrals from previous placements was second. Uh, In-house candidate databases was third. Um, and then uh, social media is highly effective, kind of came in a fourth area. And what was dead last was job boards. So interesting how in just such a short amount of time, the job boards came on to the scene and have pretty much left the scene already. And so it, it kind of is that testament to, you know, what's coming next and are we ready for it so that we can be positioned to make sure that we've got the top talent coming into our organization. So as this is switching gears a little bit. This data is from the Mayo Clinic for Social, social Media. They've been tracking actual healthcare facilities utilization of, of social media for the last probably four or five years um, and really have, um, have published these kinds of areas in terms of what healthcare organizations specifically are doing to connect with candidates. And they also basically found that more than 1,500 hospitals have social, social media sites that they're managing. Um, hospitals are using it for various purposes. A lot of um, hospital social media management has to do with patients um, and their families and connecting patients and families. I've seen some really great sites around that, but they also are using it for recruitment. One of our um, colleagues in the San Diego area at Scripps Health um, in San Diego says that they have a weekly online forum with a, you know, connect with a recruiter forum so that their recruiters are actually online chatting with people about um, job opportunities in their organization every single week. I guess it's two clicks. Um, so AMN being the largest, um, you know, staffing workforce solutions company in the country, you know, we have to, for, to we have to have a large supply of, of um, candidates to supply our our clients with the, the people that they need, the highly qualified people that they need. So we have to continue to build our database. Um, and we've done so um, in a lot of different ways, but we have been following social media since, really carefully since 2007. I, I have to say our marketing department has taken a lead in this area and really dove in, you know, decided we needed to be doing surveys, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but really to understand that market that's out there and how we can be involved and be a part of it. Uh, because it is, it is changing the way we do things. Um, we utilize um, innovative strategies and continue to challenge ourselves to move beyond the same traditional met methods year after year so that we know every single year there's going to ha have to be something new that we're going to have to be looking at that people, those candidates out there, are looking at. And if we don't, you know, then we, we um, are not able to have the candidate supply that we need, and that's not a situation that we can be in. So with that, we wanted to understand, you know, what is the clinician's path to a job? What are they doing to, um, to do their um, job search? How, how are they going about it? So we knew social media was beneficial for networking with peers and engaging conversations, but what we weren't too confident about, this is kind of back in the 2007, 2008 time frame, time frame, was the value of using social media to find candidates and connect them with career opportunities and assignments. So what was our first step? We said, okay, we're gonna go out and see what's out there. Who's done some research on this? There must be some survey data. So this was around 2009 probably, and there was nothing out there. No survey data at all. And, and, but we knew that we, um, you know, we had these questions, we needed to get them answered, and we needed to ask the candidates about them. So what we did was, um, we really recognized that, that we were probably in a position to 
do this, the research ourselves. We've got you know, databases of clinicians. We've got you know, portal sites that are not necessarily people that have worked for us, but we also have our own databases that are people who have certainly applied with us and, whether, and may have worked with us or not. So we thought we've got a rich database that we, can, that we can access to ask these questions. So let's see if we can find out what's going on. Took us, that was around 2009, took us a couple years to get this, the survey, uh, no, one year. I think we launched the first survey in 2010. But we did know that, number one, we couldn't ignore social media. If we ignored it, we were gonna fall by the wayside. And I think everybody's got to recognize that in this, this day and time. We knew that our customers and their influencers are online. We know that most online Americans use at least one social networking site. I know I'm signed up with a lot of them, but I don't know that I would actually say I use them. <laughs> I need to get better at that. Um, and content creation and sharing is on the rise, right? You've seen those, those sites that are out there, you know, Wikipedias and, and one, ones like that. Um, social networks are gaining popularity for businesses. You know, all, we can't just have our own websites anymore. We, all, we have to have our own Facebook pages, Facebook sites for our businesses too, right? Um, and then there's a stronger connection when interacting with companies via social media. So we conducted our first survey in, um, did I go backwards? No, that's it. Um, in 2010, as I mentioned, here's the results of our um, second, which was done in 2011. Um, we did another survey late in 2012 and are compiling those results right now. Um, but really, here's kind of what we looked at. We did a multidisciplinary study and had almost 3,000 respondents, but really we did believe that clinicians wanted to share their experiences with social media. So 2010, um, the candidates that the respondents said basically 20, you know, one in five basically was um, using um, social media for job searching, 6% for interviews, 5% for job offers, and 3% for new jobs. In 2011, that job searching jumped to 31%. So I don't know what it is for 2012, but my guess is it's probably another significant jump. Um, and you can see the other um, items uh, pretty much, you know, kind of went up, you know, 70, uh, doubled, you know, roughly doubled, a little bit less than that perhaps. And then, you know, the question that we wanted to answer was, are these people, are people using social media for their job searches? Is that the way that it's going to work? And, and I think we, we found the answer and, and we're pleased with it, but also knew directionally where we needed to head. So the other thing that we got insight into was how people are using mobile platforms. So we also wanted to ask about that, that phone, you know, that phone and how important that phone is to them. And it's interesting because we'd asked our nurses a question four or five years ago and got very little use of, they just aren't using mobile apps, not, not important and whatnot. When we asked it of physicians in our surveys, they're the ones that were using the mobile apps on the phone. And they also like the, the um, alerts that tell them something is new because they're always attached. You know, they've had, they're the ones that were carrying beepers, you know, always, you know, back in the day. So, you know, physicians were the ones that really are using, utilizing the mobile apps more. Um, and as this slide points out, about one in three um, use their mobile devices for healthcare content as well. And about 17% of physicians are using alerts to alert them of either new content that's out there or um, you know, other things. We, um, let me think I get to this a little bit later, let's see. Okay, so some of the things that we were looking at um, you know, in terms of mobile job alerts, getting those set up, we did um, launch a mobile app on our physician site because that's what the survey told us where we should go first is physicians are using this more often than others. Um, and then utilizing just other, you know, texting, um, QR codes and mobile advertising to really get our job alerts out into the hands of potential candidates. We put, when, when we did this, we actually um, posted all this and started gaining traction, but we had actually, within just a few months, 5,000 subscribed users to get these kinds of alerts. So we, we knew then that you know, what we had heard on the surveys was correct and accurate that people are wanting to use this. So here's the, uh, the picture of our MHA. MHA is our uh, physician permanent placement brand. Um, and this is where we launched um, the mobile app. Um, we've launched a subsequent, subsequent one since then, which, which is a nurse job app. Um, 
and um, really just learned that it was um, it, this was very valuable to people. We did launch it um, on the i on the um, iPhone iOS platform. Um, you know now with the, the um, you know speed with which the Android and the uh, you know, other phone, other smart, smart ah, can't talk smartphones are coming into play. We realize there's another gap now. We've got to cover that gap as well and make sure that we've got they've got access. Not just iPhones aren't the only tool in use there. Um, so we see that there's more that has to be done there. But beyond just the technology and the use of social media comes this, um, uh, this piece about building your brand within it and how to, how to best communicate that brand message that you're trying to communicate out to that candidate pool. Because that's what's going to speak to them in terms of whether or not they're the right fit for your organization and, and to draw them into your organization. So actually, when we think about this in terms of travel nursing, about 1.5% of nurses are travel nurses. It's a really small number. And there's 2.6 you know, million employed nurses out there. So there's, so there's a messaging problem. You know, there's, we're, we need to get that message out about travel nursing. And how do we do that? So we, wanna build, we wanted to build awareness um, about travel nursing, but we wanted to use it in a, the context of social media as well. Um, to be able to get our brand message out there, the, talk, the discussion about travel nursing, and to make it feel real to people. So what we did was we launched a campaign to, um, to our travelers about a, a journey video contest. And so they sent in their videos to us, um, and we were able to pull together a sample of some of the videos that came out of the program. Um, so basically, we've, uh, the video has about probably four or five different actual travel nurses talking about their experiences. Um, one of them is a winner who got married and has been traveling with his wife uh, for the last year and a half. Um, another one was a mother of four kids um, that were, I don't know, you know, from like four to ten or so, and she and her husband took the kids with them. Um, another one was the husband was filming the nurse um, laying on an air mattress in the ocean. <laughs> so talking about travel nursing. So put this video clip together though, and then are, we're able to put that up on our sites where people can actually go and see, view the video, understand you know what's going on from there that that person's own mouth. You know, in marketing, often we use um, stock photos quite a bit, and sometimes that can feel you know, kind of stiff and fake. Well, these are the real thing here, and they really do, um, you know, tell a story that you, that's just very different and more powerful about your, you, the message you're trying to create, and your brand. Um, the gal in the braids there is named uh, Nikki. Um, she's a grandmother, has been traveling for a few years. She's a second career registered nurse. Um, but the ads with her image on them got uh, four times the number of clicks as the, ad, the other ads that we had used with stock photos before. So she just was a real person um, to nurses. And, and I think with that, you know, her age is the right fit for the average age of nurses. It's in that you know, mid to high 40s. Um, so it just really, those photos really resonated um, with the people that were coming to the, um, to the site. So that's one way to think about you know, making your brand come to life for people, you know, we live in this time of reality TV shows all the time too, right? Um, you know, and this just makes, it, it brings that real life home to people. So after we had our success with the, kind of the nursing video, um, we thought, okay, can we take this and apply this now to the physician side of the business, right? So we did it a little bit differently. Um, then we did the nurses, but we actually pulled a panel of six physicians together to talk about um, their careers, um, you know, kind of what they do, how do they, what, you know, how they got into locum tenens, which is, you know, we have a locum tenens physician brand. We actually have two of them, Staff Care um, and Lindy is the other one. Um, and so these physicians are on YouTube, you know, talking about, you know, that experience and, and why it's good. So, um, so you can see here that the value of social media isn't just about, you know, kind of setting up those social media sites and making sure you have them, but it's providing content on those sites that can be really rich in terms of describing your, um, your culture, your brand, what, you know, what's your, your, your quality, what you're all about, to, directly to the candidates from other candidates' mouths, which is really, really powerful. And then finally, in this particular area, you know, it's really important not to forget the culture and values of your organization. These are things that I think healthcare facilities and systems do really, really well in terms of 
um, talking about their culture, their values, their quality metrics. You know, quality metrics are, are available on everybody now, and um, you certainly want to be talking about those, but those are going to be things that candidates are looking at as well in making decisions on whether or not they're going to go uh, practice at a particular facility. So I'm going to move on. Are there any questions about that? We do have a, um, our, our surveys, we have um, two of them are published, and like I said, the 2012 results will be um, coming out in the next, I'm not sure when, month or so. Um, so that will be available on our website, and I, you know, it'll be interesting to see the re what the results, um, you know, turn up with. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be more, more of the same, but um, hopefully guiding us in terms of, you know, where we're headed with our recruiting going forward, but where you all should be too with, um, within your organizations. Um, and if you want access to that, that or a copy of it, I'm sure we can get that to you. I'm going to move on, though, now to screening. Um, and I'm going to focus mostly, you know, screening encompasses an awful lot of different things. Um, you know, on the left-hand side of this slide, really that fit, that competency fit within your organization. Do they have the skill set, the experience, the education that you need? I'm really going to focus more on the background side of things, uh, verification of credentials and background screening. Um, because like recruitment, especially in background screening, that is moving forward at, at an explosive rate in terms of change and what it's um, accomplished over the last 10 years or so. Um, we use background screening, um, you know, I think in, in healthcare quite a bit. In fact, general businesses, I think it's really common to do background screening in, but it's not something that you can, you know, take lightly either. Um, so there's lots of benefits of doing background, background screening. Um, you're not only screening for the best match, but you're also screening, you know, to screen people out who may have things they're trying to hide in their background. Um, perhaps they are not who they say they are. We've seen that happen in a couple of instances in the, the recent past with some, um, you know, stories out in the media about an imposter physician. Um, but you also want to um, be able to screen people, the, you know, you're looking for that right fit. And, it, you know, any of these reasons are going to be, contribute to, you know, your culture and a, a continuing culture of quality, um, you know, by being able to make sure that you do have a, you know, more secure and safe work environment, that you've got quality people working for you, that you, you know, don't have employee theft, you know, kind of rampant in your organization. So lots of good reasons to do it. Um, it, but it is important to know the law um, when you're doing background screening. There's three different ways you can do it. You can use an outside vendor, which I think is what most organizations do. You can do it yourself, and then you can use a combination of the two. We, we do contract with an outside vendor. We've um, had a relationship with the vendor for many years. Um, and um, really rely on them as the experts. And that's really why I think you know, contracting out for it is probably the best bet at this point, because you can um, you know, uh, you know, work out an arrangement with them so that they're continuously educating you about what's going on in the industry. With the digital digitalization of records, more and more states are developing their own state repositories for records. It used to be five, ten, five or six years ago that there was only a handful of states that had state state compiled records, and now it's up to about 21 or 22, I think. So I think that's going to continue happening. What that does is make makes your search a little bit tougher. Um, we've um, you know often used the um, what, what's called the county resided searches. So you search where where the person has lived. But as you know, just because you happen to live in a county doesn't mean you wouldn't go to the next county and commit a crime, right? Um, so you know not always the best way to go, and that's why these state searches might be better. But even then, if you live in southern Minnesota, doesn't mean you can't go to um, northern Iowa and commit your crime. Even though you ran the Minnesota check, you still didn't run the Iowa check because you didn't know that they were in Iowa, right? So, um, so s some difficulties with background screening that where things can get missed um, through no fault of the person entering the information to be, to be searched or the vendor themselves. Um, it's really a, a, a very complex um, process and continuing to change. Um, the areas that you have to be careful of is the consumer reporting side. So that includes your background, your criminal background checks, as well as your credit checks that you may be doing. Um, that's where the FCRA, which is the Fair Credit um, Reporting Act, um, is the most, for the most part, the umbrella law that we're all working under. And I'm not going to go into the details of that. Um, 
But uh, suffice it to say that you do need to understand and know it and make sure that your, your facility has a policy on background checks and you're complying with the notifications um, related to the laws. Um, let's see, so some of, I think I covered most of this. Um, uh, Consumer Reporting Agency, um, CRA is the name, is what is, these folks are called and referred to in the FCRA law. Um, they are, there are certain, um, regulations they have to follow to be within the law and be very, very careful within the law. Um, it has to do with not reporting information that they've received kind of carelessly, so they need to make sure that they're, you know, pretty darn comfortable that the person that they're reporting this, this crime against is that person. There's only so far back they can go back to search records. They know all of those things, and that's why I, you know those third parties I think are best. There is an association out, and that's the, the logo on the top right of the screen there. The National Association of Professional Background Screeners um, is the name of the association, and there's a lot of good information at that site. But they, they do kind of post guidelines for those um, organizations and, and um, uh, so that they can um, keep up with things and, and also kind of keep up with the laws. The, the most recent law I think that's um, out there right now is called Ban the Box. I don't know if you all have seen that. It's, it's laws in certain states that, you know, you get your checkbox on your application that says, have you ever been convicted of a crime, right? We love that checkbox. <laughs> I do anyway. <laughs> um, but in many states, that checkbox has been banned. You cannot ask it on the application, and you have to wait until an offer has been made. Now, in healthcare, we're, in most states, are exempted from that because our our candidates are, are you know, caring for people in very vulnerable situations. Um, so it's not been something that's impacted healthcare at this point, but those kind of, you know, keeping up with those kinds of things are really important in knowing where they're headed. If it were to head to the point where it's a, you know, something that would affect healthcare, you know, I think we'd want to be working on something with, uh, you know, our associations about that. Uh, because that would be concerning. Um, but uh, we have found that our um, vendor is, re we meet with them quarterly, um, just like we meet with our MSP candidates or MSP clients um, quarterly as well. But they update us on the industry, the business, our metrics, the SLAs that they've given us. So all of those sorts of things, we go through those and um, you know, um, try to keep understanding this industry that really is exploding. The last thing I wanted to talk about in this section um, is the healthcare data banks. So um, the um, National Practitioner Data Bank has been around for quite a while. It's a, it's a government um, database um, set up within the um, Health and Human Services um, Department. Um, been, been around since I want to say the late 90s. And for any of you that, I don't know if anybody's in medical staff offices, but you've probably been using it to um, enroll your physicians in for years. Um, it's got really good solid data on license actions and malpractice claims, malpractice settlements um, with related to, uh, related to physicians. And the database has been around for over 10 years, so it's a pretty solid and, and has good information. But about four or five years ago, they, at the same time they created the National Practitioners Data Bank, they also created this Healthcare Integrity and Protection Data Bank, HIBDIB it's called. Um, and that one is for allied professionals and nurses. Um, wasn't, didn't quite get launched as well as the, the NPDB did, but just about four or five years ago, it was um, converged with the NPDB. So now when you inquire and uh, do a query with NPDB, you can query for nurses and allied health, health professionals as well. And those same types of license issues and claims um, settlements will show up for you. Um, so that is a, a screening mechanism that we've certainly employed recently. We've, um, and actually I think we registered about three or four years ago. Um, but they have both the initial inquiry that you can um, do, but you can also set up a continuous monitoring. And that will actually um, tell you if anything changes. And we have had a, an alert on a license um, it was a person who was working in, uh, had, had an Illinois license, but was working on the West Coast in a, I think Indian Health Services, so it was a government, so he didn't need another state license, but he only had Illinois. Meanwhile, in, Illinois had revoked his license because he didn't pay taxes or something. It was a non-payment of something. And the letter, snail mail letter, of course, went to his home in Illinois, where his son was supposed to be watching for important mail <laughs> and, and sort of forgot that part. So the guys working didn't know anything about it. We got the hit on the continuous query, query and called him up and said, hey, did you know? And he's like, no, I had no idea. 
he contacted the board to care of the situation and got his license reinstated and it didn't work any of the, the gap in between there, but it was really, really helpful in that particular situation. Now that was one that you know, certainly prevented something, but there's other things that can be worse than that. That one was, was you know, turned out to be fairly harmless, but it was good that we knew um, so that he could um, take action on his license. Um, so I, you know, I do recommend this. This is something that I, you know, we've been uh, pulling together for the staffing industry as well as a recommendation just from a quality perspective that the, in, the staffing industry really ought to be um, using these checks. They're very, uh, you know, on a, a one, one at a time basis, they're very inexpensive. It's like $7 or something um, to sign up a person. You know, when you're doing thousands of them, it, it gets a little bit pricey, but it is well worth it to um, use this data bank. The last area that I wanted to talk about um, is really physicians. So, you know, physicians are just a different breed um, than our um, than our other um, healthcare professionals, our nurses and allied health professionals and pharmacists. Um, and as you probably know, and as the ACA is making it more and more apparent, I think, but you know, there is a growing physician shortage in the U.S. primarily in primary care. Um, it's where, you know, Ralph was kind of talking earlier, there's going to be lots of opportunities for nurse practitioners and physician's assistants to start to step into that primary care space. Um, but um, with that shortage of physicians, the competition for recruitment becomes, you know, much more um, compelling in terms of what do you have to do to attract physicians to your organization. The other thing that has changed dramatically for phys physicians in the last 15 years is really how they're employed. You know, more and more they are employed by hospitals rather than running their own business. Um, and they're working nine to five or maybe even part time. So a really different model than what was there in the past. Um, typically, uh, physician attrition, if you're able to track it, has been very low. But I would anticipate that as time goes on and we're more in this employee-employer relationship, that kind of, that, that attrition could grow a little bit. Um, in the future, so something to uh, pay attention to. Um, I think it's really important that we, you know, take care with your physician um, recruiting strategies and that it's not something that you just kind of do on an ad hoc basis, but that it's, you know, an ongoing continuous effort that there, you've always got a pipeline, um, you know, uh, coming through. So this slide um, just kind of depicts the uh, recruiting process for, for physicians that this is this continuous cycle kind of begins with a formal physician needs assessment plan. Um, so, you know, kind of examining your existing staff in terms of your age, the practice styles, retirement plans of people, the demographics, your disease incidents. These are things that, you know, hospitals at, at the system-wide level are, are understanding more and more about within their communities as well. Um, it needs to, you know, then you've kind of got this road map that you can follow in terms of recruiting for physicians. But it also may help um, persuade recruiting candidates that a need for their services exists. So it's, it's kind of part of that recruitment and that discussion process that you get into with your, with your physicians. Um, the cycle includes multiple candidate sourcing techniques, the first of which is networking. So that's some, in the physician world, that may be your best avenue um, is to start your networking right away. Um, other sourcing techniques can be outreach to local residency programs. Um, per, you know, perhaps you dedicate a section on your website to physician. Um, maybe uh, mobile apps would be a possibility. Um, and even, you know, mail outs to um, passive candidates uh, using social media. And then attending any uh, physician specific conventions can also be a, a, a possible mechanism to, um, you know, keep your uh, pipeline filled. So screening physicians is this a complex, a complex process because you're essentially asking a stranger to trust you with their career and the personal lives of their families. And, and physicians tend to, you know, stay longer in their their um, work environments than than other healthcare type professionals. I think we see that the nurses, allied health professionals, are, uh, professionals are a lot more mobile than the physicians are. But the process begins with. Um, you know, communication um, to kind of understand what they're looking for and then, you know, kind of that talk back and forth in terms of what this need is and do we have a match between the organization and the physician. Um, so that conversation is really, really important. Um, and then just the point for physicians is that, 
you know, in their recruitment process, it really is 70% social and 30% business. You know, you need, you know, you need to have a good match. You know, you're looking for a, you know, cardiothoracic surgeon. And, I mean, those people are highly, highly experienced. They're very good at what they do. Um, but really, it's that, it's that social fit. It's do I fit within this culture? Do I fit with this in this organization? Is my family going to fit in this community? Um, you know, those conversations are really important um, in the in uh, uh, working with physicians and and um, in getting them interested in your um, organization. I wanted to just touch on, um, you know, this data that we have about, um, you know, rewarding physicians for quality outcomes, which is an interesting change. And it's amazing sometimes on these surveys when you see such a big swing, like we saw on the social media survey we did, but even on this survey, such a big swing year to year. Um, so there's a lot of salary information uh, for physicians. Um, you can get them get it from the American Medical Group Association, um, the Medical Group Management Association. Merritt Hawkins, which is our perm placement brand, has been doing surveys for years and is, is really very well known for it. They do a, an annual um, uh, compensation survey for physicians as well. Um, but it used to be that physicians were, you know, they you know, they were paid based on the, either the revenue they generated or some kind of volume metric, right? And that still is the case. But now we see that, um, you know, between 2011, less than seven percent were were rewarded on some sort of quality metric, and just a year later, that number's up to 35 percent. So obviously, aligning that with hospitals and what they're seeing and uh, feeling their, you know, their reimbursements are going to be based on quality metrics, right? Um, all, however, this piece, this 35 percent, is still only a very small component of their total compensation. So even though it's, you know, 35 percent, it's, you know, they've got, there's a quality piece of it, it's still very, very small. I think we'll continue to see that change um, as we under, learn and understand more how the reimbursement changes are um, impacting us in the U.S. Um, so I think that, you know, the message here is, you know, is how do we, how will we all keep up with these changes? Um, it's it's going to be imperative for us to do so, um, to be able to keep our positions filled and make sure that we've got the quality that we need. Um, but, you know, understanding this really, really well and understanding where the market is going and what that next thing is going to be, where the question mark is, um, is going to be really important for all of us to um, you know, to keep those um, healthcare, those clinicians that we want to hire um, in front of us all the time. I think we were talking a little bit earlier about, you know, where are these people? And if it's so competitive out there, you know, how do we, what are we doing to, to be able to get them come, to come to us? So hopefully this pre presentation, you know, kind of pulled together some of the, the um, interesting and innovating things you can be doing to, to make sure that you um, hopefully have an edge on your competition for that. Well, thanks so much.